Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. How's everybody's MAGFest been so far? Inside joke, but I hear the vibe is dead. All right, so welcome to Armcore Brief History. I got a, a bit.ly link down there at the bottom. It's got like a bare bones Google Doc uh, with like some of the things I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna add more stuff to it later. And if you have any like questions like such and such, like, hey, what was that thing that you mentioned? Just, I got you. So I got some liner notes there. Uh, to kind of like further the conversation after the event, if you like. So, panel description. For over 25 years, Armored Core maintained a relatively small but dedicated fan base, oops, while largely flying under the radar of the wider gaming community. However, while the Armored Core franchise quietly slumbered over the past decade, its developer from software has exploded in popularity and stature thanks to its various Souls-like games, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and the recent and massively successful Elden Ring. All this success and recognition set the stage for Armored Core 6, the franchise's 16th installment, <laughs> to be introduced to a whole new audience. For newcomers, this will be a primer to the greater franchise. For the veterans, it will be a nostalgic trip down memory lane. So, before we kind of get really into it, I kind of want to like survey the room. So like, of everybody that's here, who got into Armored Core with Armored Core 6? Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's probably like a quarter of you maybe? Who got into it with like, like the Xbox 360 and PS3 generation of games? Okay, a couple. PlayStation 2? Okay. PlayStation 1? Okay. That's a really nice dispersal. So, okay, for those of you that like got, in, got, like got into it from like uh, 4, 4 Answer, 5, Verdict Day, and 6, have like show of hands, who has gone back and played like the older games? Okay, some of you guys. All right, good. Got a nice mixture, I like that. So, uh, before we can talk about Armor Core itself, let's talk about its developer, From Software. Uh, From Software is formerly known as Kabushiki Gaisha From Software, while the term uh, Kabushiki Gaisha, often translated as stock company or joint stock company or stock corporation, which means that it is jointly held by the following companies. Uh, Katakawa Corporation, so if you're like an anime head, you've absolutely heard of Katakawa Corporation. They do a lot of publishing. Um, so they're a major media conglomerate um, that you've probably heard of. Uh, Six Joy Hong Kong, which is an as asset of Tencent. Some of you gaming heads have probably heard of Tencent. They are the world's largest gaming corporation based on their assets. And finally, Sony Interactive Entertainment. Um, I, I don't know how the Japanese stocks work in their companies, but I would assume that due to the fact that these three companies collectively own exactly 100% of the stock, uh, that that would mean that members of the public aren't able to purchase stock in the company the way that you, you know, were like, oh, I've got a couple shares of Apple stock. It's, it's up this month. Uh, but they were founded November 1st, 1986 by Naotoshi Zin, who is still with the company to this day in an advisory role. Uh, here he is listed on From Software's website as a member of its board of directors, um, and he was a supervisor on a whole bunch of like the early games. Uh, they originally headquartered over in Sasazuka district of Tokyo's Shibuya ward. So like, you've got uh, country, prefecture, uh, city, uh, district, ward, or ward then, ward then district. So uh, they're over there like west of Tokyo. Um, and then they are currently headquartered in Tokyo's uh, Shinjuku ward, northeast of Sasazuka. This is like maybe like 15, 20 minutes like west of like central Tokyo. But you know, it all kind of blends together. Uh, originally, they were a developer of business software, which probably included a bunch of soul-crushing spreadsheet and accounting applications. So, yeah, exciting, but that, 
They kind of like basically, you know, now they crush our souls. Um, however, in 1994, they were prompted to enter the video game industry by the introduction of a video game console you may remember. With over 100 million, so 100 million units sold, the original PlayStation was a phenomenal success and supporting the platform completely changed the trajectory of From Software as a company. And of course, it was on the original PlayStation that FromSoft released one of their defining works that we all know and love, Kingsfield. <laughs> so Kingsfield is, is like a really, like it's a deep cut, but it's this beloved first person action role playing game. Um, while it was not available on the PlayStation launch day in Japan, it was released soon after on December 16th. Uh, and they like pumped them out pretty quickly there. Uh, the first three titles were released within the first 18 months, and the fourth entry was released a few years later on the PlayStation 2. Uh, they also released two PSP RPGs um, in, 20, in 2006, uh, and that franchise has been dormant ever since. However, you could argue that it like laid the uh, foundation for a bunch of like the later games, like the Souls and the, 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 the yeah, all of those. Uh, but it's kind of boring. <laughs> see if this will work. So you just kind of like, it's a first person, dungeon crawling, action RPG, uh, you're kind of walking around in these kind of like very kind of boring dungeons. You got walls, you got, you, got, you got floor, and you got some enemies. And, that, and that's Kingsfield. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a game. Uh, their philosophy is uh, not get caught up in chasing what's popular, but rather to make games based on what we value, uh, according to H.E. Nakajima, the former senior managing director. But uh, a year after releasing Kinsfield 3, on July 10th, 1997, From Software released the original Armored Core for the Sony PlayStation. Many of the franchise's defining elements were present in this first installment. Um, I was actually really pleased, like kind of refreshed when I played six that like they kind of went back to the like kind of what made it original and like kind of got the right elements from a variety of games. But there's a lot in six that is just, it's, it's right there in the first game. Um, I'd like to share the opening cinematic for you uh, because I think it really encapsulates not only the franchise's first several generations of games, but like also the franchise as a whole. And I'm very sorry that like, it's hard to find good footage on YouTube that's not AI upscaled these days. It's kind of miserable.
It's playing it twice. <laughs> okay. It's like light wave, early 90s light wave. I love it. All right, so just as a like a little, if you've never seen like Armor Core One in uh, in action, let's mute that. Let's see, let's see if this will play correctly. Order the enemy is expected. We leave the rest up to you. System engaged. So this is like the first thing that they drop you into. They basically like, here's two, here's two enemies. Kill these enemies. So it's it's like really chunky. It's kind of hard to go back to that game these days. It's very very chunky. It's like there's there's something about like early like uh, PlayStation One, Sega Saturn, uh, like that generation, like early 3D games. Like like no disrespect, but like the original Star Fox kind of hard to go back to. Very chunky. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, um, the first title in the series received an international release thanks to having Sony Computer Entertainment publish it overseas. And um, uh, the, the cover is kind of bullshit because like he's dual wielding. And I'm like, I was always very, was anybody else confused by that? Like, how do I do that? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, whoop. So the name Armored Core is credited to renowned anime director and mecha designer Shoji Kawamori, uh, who you may know for creating the Macross series. Um, he also had a hand in the creation of like the Transformers and Optimus Prime as he was contracted uh, as a designer on Takara's 1980 Diaclone toy line. Uh, and like, there's no one person that created Optimus Prime, like even like, Peter Cullen, you know, imparted like elements of the character. You know, you got the toy, you got the designer, the toy engineer, uh, the Marvel people that came up with the biography, and then the voice actor. Like everybody kind of contributed a little bit, but he designed a lot of like the early, you know, Transformers for like that original toy line. Um, but at the time the Karmari was approached to work on Armored Core, the player's ability to build their own modular mecha was really the only set idea. Um, he kind of narrowed down the concept to an armored core, uh, a central core block uh, containing the cockpit and main systems, as well as the external connections for the remainder of the mecha's components. And like the whole kind of basic premise that's kind of related to like most of the games is like, it's not in the game. You have to read the manual. <laughs> so uh, the last war waged amongst nations known as the Great Destruction ended with mankind vanishing from the surface of the earth. The echo of humanity that survived left the howling winds and radioactive dust to make their home underground. Half a century later, the concept of the nation is no more. Instead, corporations lead and rule the populace. Though the world is making a rapid recovery through ruthless, ruthless corporate com competition, social disorder surfaces as disparities in wealth, terrorist outbreaks, and racism refuse to go away. The ruling corporations seeking ever greater power and wealth refuse to let the strife end. It is a new world order where lives are bought and sold in a twisted free market economy, but there are always exceptions to every rule. The Ravens, mercenaries who take on any mission for a price, pledge allegiance to nothing and no one and exist beyond the control of the corporations. Hired to take out the competition, the Ravens take no sides and fight without regard for good or evil. Kind of like real life, except there's no robots and we don't live underground. Uh, but you got like really like all the same basic parts that are in pretty much every game are there. You've got your head parts, which provide like your biosensors, your mapping ability, and like dedicated radar, like that's not something that is like standard in later games, like you actually had to have a radar part, typically a back part, but you could also have like your head weapons. 
Uh, something I want to see again, like if they make an expansion or a DLC for six, is bring back weapon arms. <laughs> like if you, yeah, like if you want to be oops, all missile launchers, you can have missile launcher arms. These little tiny things just have like missiles. Like bring back, bring those back, please. Uh, generator. Um, option parts, which are kind of like more analogous to like, uh, what do they call them in, in six? What do they call them? Are they just called core expansions. Um, option parts like faster turn speed, like a radar indicator, like uh, better, better uh, uh, generator efficiency, uh, shell protection, energy protection. Um, obviously back weapons, cores, like the special thing about cores is like how many option part slots they have. Uh, your legs, which have all the same like leg types as like six, except like your quad legs just have like they're fairly nimble uh, and they can hold a lot of weight, uh, but they don't hover, obviously. Um, uh, boosters, one set of boosters, uh, arm weapons, which like your your right arm is just like machine guns and things like that. Your left weapon, just blade, just blade, and it is miserable. Blading an enemy in arena is impossible. Just, just, just give up. If you run out of ammunition and your your solution is to blade the guy to death, just, just hit restart. But like, if there's an obstacle in a mission, it it can be useful. I usually don't even play with blade. I'm like, that's weight I'm not going to use. Now, now. have to briefly talk about the controls. If you're going to play this on an actual PlayStation 1, we've got to talk about the controls. Uh, so one, I hope you like tank controls. Uh, this, this is, so this is a screenshot from Armored Core 2. So spoilers, these controls stick around for a while. Uh, so the biggest control, the biggest struggle with playing like old school Armored Core is that there's no dual stick support. Your Vertical sighting is tied to the L2 and R2 button, which just never gets comfortable. Never. Like, I replayed all three original ones for this, and just, just, no. I'm going to just take my enemy in the arena to, like, the parking garage, so they can't fly anywhere. <laughs> uh, where's my cursor? There we go. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, which is unfortunate because there is actually, like, there was, uh, at the time, the analog joystick. Um, there were already multiple joystick controllers on the market. Uh, the other being the uh, dual analog controller, uh, which was released a couple months before Armored Core, uh, which functions as a DualShock minus the rumble and also can emulate this joystick. So, like, there were other... You know, you have, you've got joystick models that were available, and the DualShock came out only a couple months later, and being like a first party, well not first party, but like a published by Sony, like they should have known that that was going to be the standard and that was going to be available, but they just were like, nope. What? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. Moving right along. Uh, so something that kind of exists in various forms in the Armor Core series is something called Human Plus that you might even just completely forget, like just don't know exists. Like you can play through the games and just like what that exists. Uh, uh, but yeah, you have like the augmented humans and like the OS tuning and like six. But uh, in the early games, there's this concept called Human Plus. There's actually an incentive to be bad at the game. So if, if you basically run out of money, like you go negative 50,000 in credits, uh, they'll actually give you a bonus. Yes, his papers say he was a raven. Oh, so he took the usual route here. Seems to have piled up quite a debt. 
must have dashed his dreams. But he will be reborn in this experiment. That is, if he lives. Hmm, you have a point there. Let's get started. Yeah, so every, every time you go like 50,000 in debt, it gives you a, like an a increased, like, you, like get, for example, um, the first thing you get is just an automatic radar, regardless of what parts you're using. Uh, you get missile elevation indicators for the radar. You get better turning speed, better moving speed, better energy capacity. Uh, you can shoot a laser blast out of your, out of your laser blade. Um, but you'll run into enemies that have this ability that are just like unfairly, like have an unfair advantage against you. Uh, something that you might not be aware of is that like there was actual link cable compatibility, so you could do, if you had two TVs and two PS1s and two copies of the game, you could do one-on-one. -on, -one. on the back, like, you're like, hey, that port on the back of my PS1, and you never knew what it did, that's what it does. <laughs> you can get a link cable, and you can connect your systems together, and you can play one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you know, in the room with you. And there are a bunch of other games that use this. Doom, Descent, Wipeout, Twisted Metal 3, you know, because split screen was terrible in some of these games, but you could actually do like real time one on one. So, uh, Armored Core Project Phantasma was the first standalone expansion. It was released only five months after the base game. You didn't have to have the original game, uh, but like there's things that carry over. Uh, and like, it's only 13 missions. Like if you, you, if you just play the missions, you can get through this game in like a couple of hours, especially if you carry over your save from the base game. Um, and I really like the, uh, the intro animation because it uh, like really uh, kind of highlights the diversity of like the parts and designs that are available within the game. This, this YouTuber really should have like trimmed down the video before they uploaded it. try and blast through this as much as we can. So you could uh, import your save, which would allow you to access uh, hidden parts, um, as well as use the human plus abilities. You actually had to have the first game to do the human plus abilities. Um, they introduced um, uh, the, uh, the arena for the first time. There was only like a, a, a raven ranking uh, in the first game, which is based on like your progression through the game, but they actually you know, threw in like I think it was like 30 to 50 like one-on-ones that you could do. Um, it's entirely optional, but I think like the great thing about the arena across the whole franchise is that it gives you like a little bit more variety. It's like it's absolutely padding, <laughs> but it helps like keep the game from getting too stale by just being like mission, 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 mission. Uh, but in the game, of the, ins the instance of this game, if you just play the campaign, you'll just you'll just burn through it, and you'll be like, man, that was short. So I think they might have like created it just for that purpose. Uh, and spoilers, they didn't add support for thumbsticks. <laughs> but they did, ask, they did add rumble support. Uh, and then the next was Mar Master Arena, another standalone ex uh, expansion. Um, the arena uh, is now, let's see, let's see what we've got. Uh, new campaign, new parts. Again, save and port. There are a few hidden parts. Uh, the arena is now mandatory. Like, you'll try to do, like, mission, 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 and then it'll be like, yo, you gotta fight this dude. And if you're like, well, I just wanna, like, fight this dude, fight this dude, it's like, yo, you gotta go do a mission. So, like, there's this kind of weird, there's, like, this interesting back and forth where, like, you have to go missions, now you have to do arena, so it, like, kind of forces you to do both, which is kind of cool. Like, people will send you messages, like, taunting you and being like, hey, watch out for this guy. 
Uh, and I feel like the arena was like really implemented really well in this, this expansion. Um, and the nice thing is they actually gave you a second disc for the link mode. So if you had a friend that had a PlayStation 1, it'd be a lot easier to, to play it. Uh, so a year later, Sony released the PS2, which ushered in a new generation of gaming, as well as a new generation of Armored Core, which is Gen 2. Uh, Armored Core 2 was released August 3rd, 2000, and while it was not a launch title in Japan, it was in North America. So it was one of the like, launch titles that I was really excited to pick up. Uh, but you're now on, you're now on Mars, um, still the same timeline, but like humans have reached out uh, to the stars. And I feel like this is like one of the coolest intros in the franchise. Yeah, and real talk, this series has great music. Like, just this, it, you know, like 90s, 2000s, like synthy electronic. It's good stuff. So, did anybody notice how there were there were there were two teams of three, but they only showed like three of them getting destroyed? I just conveniently forgot about two other robots. Um, but as a lot of you know, like the um, the going from like the original PlayStation to PlayStation Two was like just a huge performance boost for like a lot of games. So like Armored Core Two. It's like you're playing like the ideal version of Armored Core One. Like it's so much smoother. Uh, it it has like the same like general like pace. Like you know how like I say like if you look pay attention to like NES Mega Man and like Mega Man X, they all have the same jump height. They have the same run speed. It's all exactly the same. It just it's a lot smoother. It's the same way with this game. Like everything is just a lot smoother. So like I'd say like if you've never played a classic Armor Core, two is a good place to start. It's really hard to go back to those PlayStation One Armor Core games. Like the frame rate just chunks. So uh, Armor Core Two introduced Overboost, which is in a lot of later games, um, and it introduced something that is like really like is this a good idea or a bad idea? Not really sure, but it's like there's a couple of different versions of this. Like you've got your Primal Armor later on in Four and Four Answer. You've got your Stagger in Armor Core Six. Armor Core 2 has radiators and weapon heat. So the way that works is you have a dedicated part that's a radiator that cools your AC, uh, and different weapons will actually contribute heat to your core. So like previously when you get hit with a grenade, you're just like, damn, that was a lot of damage. Now you're like, damn, that's a lot of damage and a lot of heat. So when your AC overheats, you start taking like damage, kind of like if you're like in a room with like acid, like you're, you're just basically deteriorating from the excess heat. Uh, they added extension parts that just like basically like, clip on to like the shoulders, which include like support missiles to shoot more missiles, missile interceptors, um, the ability to like press the button and then just get boosted down real fast or boosted back. Uh, insight parts, like you can drop little like grenades or um, like radar spoofers. 
Um, and then they added like shields as like a left arm type. So if you were like, yo man, that blade was useless, you can get a shield now. Uh, also, idling compatibility, something that I'm sure like absolutely nobody used. Does any show of hands who actually knows what idling is? One guy. <laughs> Yeah, Has, have, you ever, have you ever looked at the USB ports on there and be like, man, what, what's, what's that thing? That's the link cable port. So in some cases, this is way cooler than in others, but in Armored Core 2, you can do one-on-one -on -one eye link kind of the way you could on the PS1. Or if you're really into like time crisis, you could do time crisis double monitor with different view modes. Yeah, the way it was meant to be played. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. And then, like the, the first games, uh, Armor Core 2 got an expansion called Another Age. Um, really, all that I want to say about this one is that they got rid of the arena, and instead of like having arena, arena missions, um, there's a hundred campaign missions. And I've heard that if you actually get through, like the, the end game in this is really, really fun and really cool, but it's a hundred missions. It is very repetitive. Um, but they did add something that's kind of interesting called the limiter release. So like if there's like a really big chasm that you have to cross and you're like in a real heavy tank, um, you can actually click like R3 um, and basically give yourself unlimited, uh, unlimited energy for like a specific amount of time, depending upon what core and such that you have. Um, so, but like then if, oh, I forgot to mention, if you never played an original Armored Core, when you run out of energy, your whole generator has to uh, recharge. And then you have no energy for like a solid 30 to 60 seconds. So if you run out of energy in the arena, <laughs> good luck. Especially if you're using energy weapons. Bless your heart if you run energy weapons in, in arena. You don't need to. Only in mission to save money. <laughs> um, so there's the limiter release. Uh, they, they improve the target. So like if, it's, if, it's, if your view is blocked by an obstacle, it changes color. Um, they actually tell you more about the, the parts that you're gifted. They got rid of the arena. Uh, and there's also versus missions. You can only play them in split screen and we tried them out and they were very unfun <laughs> so like if you have a mission where there's an objective and you're like okay cool it's a race it's not a race the reason why it's not a race is they start both of you in the same room so guess what happens <laughs> one of you kills the other person and then the other person watches you just complete the rest of the mission uh, they only did one expansion for Armored Core 2, which leads us to Gen 3, which is Armored Core 3. And also a really good starting point for classic Armored Core. Uh, I, I would say this is like, if you want to play something on the PlayStation 1 or the PlayStation 2, 3 or 2, but preferably 3. But 3 has my favorite cinematic in all of Armored Core. It's cool, it's cinematic, but it's, 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 oh, I, I, this is, this is, this is chef's, this is chef's kiss S tier for me. That's, yeah, absolutely. Hey, hey.
So I'd say part of part of why like Armor Core Three is like kind of considered like a new, like a I new. Whoop, normally, normally I have like a little audio mixer handy, but I don't today. Um, like Three is. I want to say they like overhauled the game engine like a lot uh, because it just kind of feels faster, you know, more like action oriented. Um, but it like largely all the mechanics are roughly the same, but like there's no continuity in terms of like parts or in save importing because um, you can import your save from two to another age, but you can't import anything from another age or two to three. Like it's a completely new set of everything and it just plays a lot faster. Um, and a lot, I'd say, also a little bit smoother. Um, but as far as like what they did, like I'm assuming they overhauled the game engine. Um, new timeline, maybe, because uh, like, everybody lives in a new thing called Laird, and it's run by an AI called the Controller. Um, let's see, uh, Human Plus does not exist anymore. Um, instead, there's now like a New Game Plus part that you can unlock new abilities. Um, they now have some ranged left arm weapons, so you can like actual dual wield now. Um, there's a consort system, which I never ever used. Uh, I don't need consorts. Uh, but you can hire a consort to help you in a mission, like a little MT, um, occasionally an AC. Um, the arena returns, of course. Um, and for like something that was super annoying in the earlier games is like if you lost in the arena, it had to take you back to the menu and you had to go back into the arena. Now they actually let you retry. I, 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 it's such a small thing, but it is, makes a huge difference. And then Human Plus was replace, replaced by the uh, OP intensify part that you get when you beat the game and complete all the missions or just the mission. I can't remember which one. It's either just the game or like everything. Um, but there's also iLink hub compatibility now. There's like no first party iLink hub, but like innovation and another company or two made like a hub. Uh, and you can, it can, you can have five systems. You can have four, like four, like one, one V four or one V three, however you want to call it. Every free for all four, four player free for all. Uh, and then a fifth spectating screen. Um, and that's kind of the standard going forward for like multiplayer. Um, Armor Core 3, Silent Line. Over in here, we, we called it Silent Line Armor Core, but it is technically Armor Core 3 Silent Line. Uh, and I don't think they really made any mechanical game differences. It's just, I think it's just more Armor Core 3. Um, I couldn't really find too much like, there's like this like map change or like this, you know, new parts, but there's really no new features to really speak of. Um, but there is like some interesting kind of like lore stuff in there where it's like, it might still be the same timeline because there might be multiple pockets of people living underground. But from here, it kind of like moves into this kind of like weird, vaguely like, it's not Gen 3, but it's not a new gen, because they just keep pumping these games out. It's, it's kind of nuts. Uh, Armor Core Nexus. Um, I never played Nexus, uh, but um, it's the same storyline. It's like there's continuity in the storyline, um, but there's, and there's some assets that are reused, but there's no save import, um, and it's kind of a new gen, but not really. Um, so there's a new campaign, new parts, etc. cetera. Uh, you can now do dual analog controls for the first time. It only took them, what, 11? <laughs> uh, so you're, like in like a modern game, you're, you're sighting, your movement is on one stick, your sighting is on another stick, and then you've got your, like, your left and your right, your boost, and your, your weapon changes. So like still exact same core parts, the exact same buttons, so just laid out in a way that actually makes sense. Uh, Real-time mission availability. So if you spend too much time in the arena or on a particular mission, you can miss out on other missions. Uh, they updated the heat and radiator system. So like, if you ever like, you know, this radiator heat system isn't realistic enough, you're gonna regret that. Because now, um, 
when you overheat in game, uh, your radiator takes more energy to cool you down. So you now, not only are you overheating and taking additional damage, but now you're also out of energy, which is very unfun. Uh, and the arena aggression is no longer based on like, beat this guy, beat this guy, beat this guy, beat this guy. It's actually based on performance and that a little bit. Uh, oh, and night vision, very important, night vision. I don't know how you did all those nighttime missions before, but now there's night vision. Uh, and then there's Armor Core Nine Breaker, uh, which is the absolute polar inverse of Another Age. Whereas Another Age was just missions, a lot of missions, Nine Breaker is arena, just arena, a lot of arena. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I never play. I never played Nine Breaker, but it was kind of interesting that like all the parts are available right away. So there's like. There's no in-game economy to like work through and get better parts, which is kind of like the cool thing about Armor Core is like working your way and tinker tinkering and revising and listening to the garage music a lot. <laughs> it's just there, yeah, there's there's no like no incentive to like oh beat this guy and get a new part, beat this guy. No, you just have all the parts, all the parts. Similarly, same thing, Formula Front uh, on the PSP. PS2 in Japan, not over here, but just PSP. Uh, it's like the closest thing to like an Armored Core Tamagotchi. Because <laughs> if you didn't know, uh, the Japanese, original Japanese version of the game, you basically built the robot and adjusted its AI, and then it just plays itself. Just plays itself. And you just watch. You just spectate. Um, you can play the American version like that, if you want, but that's if you want. So, this guy. Uh, so we're still in 2004, but not only did 2004 see the release of three games in the Armor Core franchise, but it also saw the addition of Hidetake Miyazaki to the company. Uh, Miyazaki's initial credit would be as a gameplay designer on uh, uh, Last Raven, um, and he would, from that point on, leave an indelible mark on the company's games. Uh, here he is seen in this photo from Time's 100 Most Influential People of 2023. So, he worked on Last Raven, um, and it's kind of aptly titled, I think, because it's, it's like the last PlayStation 2. It's like that whole... Uh, Iteration, like every game is like an iteration where they make a little change, a little change, a little change. And like this is the last one in that kind of unbroken line. Um, but this installment saw some new additions, tweaks, and changes, but it never truly rebuilt the game from the ground up. So you can import your save from Nexus. Uh, it's the first game that has multiple endings based on story decisions. And they refined the heat system to be much less annoying. Um, and they added, like, basically, like, you could always resell your part back to the shop for the same value that it was when you bought it, which let you kind of, like, experiment a lot. But in this one, they actually depreciate. You know, like, how when you bought a car, they're like, hey, you want to buy gap insurance? Because <laughs> the minute you drive that car off the lot, it's not worth as much. But they basically have a part depreciation system in this game, so it was, like, less incentive to experiment, um, or you gotta like farm or grind for more money or do well to get more money. So the in-game economy is like really tight in this game. Also, part damage mechanics. Your parts can get damaged and you have to buy replacements. So get good. Uh, I, I've heard people say that Last Raven is like one of the hardest Armor Core games. Like in a true kind of like soulsy kind of way. So, moving into Gen 4, uh, we have Armor Core 4, uh, which huge changes to Armor Core. Uh, not, only was it, um, not only was it multi-platform for the first time since its inception, um, it was also released for the Xbox 360, um, but the game was completely built from the game up. I've never liked this game. 
I'm very, very sorry. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some effort into four answer and, and try to understand why everybody likes four answer so much, but I just, I've tried to play four multiple times and I just don't like it. It is just, I need a better controller that has back buttons because there's, 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 there's too many boosts. Like, I was playing six and I was like, got to get a back button attachment. It's just, I, I will not enjoy this game until I get a back button attachment because you've got three boosts in this game. You had four in six, but you didn't really need to use one because it's just like the glide boost, which is like, who uses glide boost? You just need like regular boost, dash boost, over boost. That's all you need. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm very, very sorry, but the controls are terrible again, which So, here's the thing. I, this was from a presentation. This was originally from a presentation, and it's this weird mixture of like, it's real, but it's a joke, but then it became real, and then it became a joke again. I'm not really sure. But Armored Core 4 is like, it's fast. It's like Zone of Enders. You boost a lot in Zone of Enders. It's a fast game. And Armored Core is like, Zone of Enders, here, hold my beer. <laughs> I think this video is actually from, I don't know if this is from 4 or 4 Answer, but it's the same difference. They're both very fast games. You just boost all over the place. You're just shooting at a little dot. Yeah. So to be fair, there are lots of there's lots of um, there's lots of matches in like six and even like the early games that are like thirty seconds long. You can obliterate your opponent in thirty seconds. It's that's not a weird thing, but like in this, you're just boost, 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 shooting at a little a little dot. Whereas like I feel like in other games, there's like a lot better fidelity of what you're shooting at, which I think is a really important thing in a game being engaging. Also, quad legs are stupidly fast now. <laughs> Once again, I think, I think this is actually from uh, Four Answer, but still, it's, both games are just insanely, insanely fast. Um, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of 4, I never have, I just could not get into it for whatever reason. I'm going to try, I promise I'll try. Uh, and, I've, and because I haven't spent much time with 4, I haven't spent much time with 4 Answer, uh, but I, 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 I sampled it a little bit leading up to this, and like right away, um, like small things, but like 4, really, really boring looking game. Just lots of gray, lots of like light brown, very, very dull color palette. But in like 4 Answer, they did little things like there's better contrast, there's little splashes of blue. Like Armored Core 6 has a very limited color palette, but like they give you splashes of color when it's necessary to like really kind of like give you a little bit of pop, you know? So it's not like it's not like you're playing Katamari Damacy where it's just like color, color everywhere. But it's visually a little bit better looking. It, the mechanics felt a little bit more like refined, like they kind of figured out what they were doing. But we gotta talk about something very important, which is the year 2009. 2009 saw the release of Demon Souls. So, after releasing over 40 games over 15 years, Demon's Souls was arguably from software's first major hit that gave them international recognition as a AAA game developer. But it almost wasn't. 
Internally, it was considered a failure due to an uncompelling prototype. Uh, it was at this point that uh, Miyazaki stepped in. Uh, he said, I figured if I could find a way to take control of the game, I could turn it into anything I wanted. Best of all, if, all my, if my ideas failed, nobody would care it was already a failure. <laughs> Smart man. Um, but as we all know, uh, Demon's Souls came out to great success and recognition uh, that continues to this day. Uh, two and a half years later, Dark Souls, once again directed by Miyazaki, was released, another success for, uh, from software, uh, but an another threat uh, to the Armored Core games, uh, which leads us to Gen 5. Yeah, um, only a few months after Dark Souls, uh, Gen 5 Armored Core kicked off with Armored Core 5. Uh, rather than being directed by Miyazaki, 5 and its sequel, Verdict Day, were directed by Naoyuki Takahashi, who previously worked uh, only worked on the arena-focused Armor Core Nine Breaker as planning staff um, and Chrome Hounds. Chrome Hounds. Also, as far as I can tell, uh, the V in the title is not the letter V, but a Roman numeral V. So you can you can call it Armor Core Five. Does anybody call it Armor Core V? Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> uh, but I say like, let's see. Is, so, the, the big thing is that people describe it as, like, it followed all the trends and beats of, like, like Call of Duty. Like, it was PS, it was like P, Sony PS3-ified, basically. It followed all, like, the design cues and the gameplay cues of games of that era, you know? Uh, very dark, very gritty, very military. Um, your, your boost, like, you can boost up, and you can be like, yo, remember Disney's Gargoyles? And they were like, we have to climb up and then glide. You have to climb up and then glide. You can't just boost straight up if you want, which is like, that's not like Armored Core in any other game. Um, but there's like some interesting mechanics in this game with like the scan mode and the recon drones and your weapon bays. Because like in 4, your weapon days were just like, they were like reserve pistols. So if you ran out of ammunition, you got a reserve pistol just in case. But in five, you can actually take your weapon out of your bay and just toggle them. So you have like, you got weapon here, weapon here, weapon here, weapon here, weapon here. You have like so many weapons, which like gives you a lot more variety in like how you're going about the weapons. But everything is just like big chunky tanks, big chunky tanks. And I have not spent any time with Verdict Day, unfortunately, uh, but everything I've heard about is that it just, it's basically five, but kind of refined. Uh, and this is the point where like, we enter the void, the dark times. Uh, it's a 10 year span that breaks the prolific history of the Armored Core franchise, where previously we saw on average an Armored Core game once a year. Instead, From Software pursued their new focus on their Souls-like games. So you got Dark Souls 2 and 3, Bloodborne, Sekiro, Elden Ring. Uh, but we got Armor Core 6. And I, don't need, I, I do not need to talk about this game. I, I loved it. I, I did all three endings. Just arm weapons, please. <laughs> also, like, more, more than like a DLC, like an actual expansion, please. Um, availability of games. Physical. Nope. Uh, aside, from, aside from 6, which is the current release, all the preceding games are out of print. Uh, they are not currently available in any sort of re-release. Um, and secondhand pricing can be considered cost prohibitive. Uh, when 6 was announced, the values of all the games doubled. Your $60 game became a $120 game. Uh, digitally, you can purchase uh, the original Armored Core on PS3, PSP, and Vita. Uh, you can get the portable versions of 3, Silent Line, and Last Raven, and you can play them on your PSP and your Vita, which you totally still have. Uh, and the only thing modern-ish is Verdict Day, which you can still get on PS3 and Xbox 360. But 
that still leaves all of these games that you cannot buy in a way that financially supports the developers or the publishers of the games. So my little soapbox is that I would love to see them do a collection release, you know, like things like, the, you know, old, like if they can do things like Metal Gear Solid, you know, Legacy Collection, they can do it. I'm going to pitch you an idea. Volume 1, PS1 games, Armor Core 2, Another Age. Volume 2, the, the Gen 3s, the Gen 5s, and then you got your like, later lifespan titles as a third one. Like, it'd be great if it was just one big release, but like, if they had to break it up, do something like this, please. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> you know, um, emulators allow for a variety of quality of life improvements, um, including controller remapping, improved frame rate, uh, resolution, widescreen support, um, dual analog support, um, Nexus, in, uh, Nexus in, uh, introduced um, camera blur, and it's awful. It is awful. It is absolutely awful, uh, including like your HUD and everything. This is all blurry. Uh, so like there's a community patch if you're playing on an emulator to turn that off. Um, I do not need, I, I, Free McBoot is a thing. You can load ISOs off of a hard drive in a fat PS2 hard drive bay. Um, all these things are out there. I'll be happy to like share some resources for you if you want to play. Like you can either play it on an emulator or you can play it on real hardware. There are good methods for both. Uh, a couple other things real quick is uh, the Pilots Manual was released late last year. It's pretty cool. It's like super, super detailed. It's like 400 pages. It is so thick. Uh, if you never heard it, the, uh, the, the um, From Software has an in-house band called Frequency, um, and they play like a ton of Armored Core mixes, and their album uh, Reprises is really, really cool. Uh, definitely worth listening to. Uh, and um, there is an Overclock Remix album that's been out for a while. It's basically like the work of one dude, but it's all real good. Just, just one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. Indulge me. Indulge me here. If you've never played Mech Warrior, <laughs> try Mech Warrior. Like, try classic. If you like Armored Core, you will like classic Mech Warrior. There's like Mech Assault on like original Xbox. There's a bunch of like Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo games, but like Mech Warrior 2, 3, like give these games a try. So, mission objective achieved, system switch to normal mode. Please, not, not just for me, but for like anybody else, please leave feedback in guidebook. Um, it's really helpful for like both the panelists as well as the staff in like seeing like the how people like things um, and drink water yes. Drink water Thank you so much